from the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. Their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. Our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. And our Batman, the master of tools, gadgets, and all things mechanical, our mild-mannered soon-to-be billionaire, Alan Danvers. Their mission, to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them, and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. Dominating with Dawson. Captain's Log Supplemental. So, Miss Vicky. Yes, sir. Do you remember when we were watching those WRL events and some of those Grid Life events where you used to see the in-car video and it had like the, the cameras seeing front and back, but it also could see all the telemetry and everything that was going on? Mm-hmm. You know, most of the ones that we liked were taken by the Sentinel system. Remember James came on our podcast earlier? Right. You know, we have no excuse since he uh, lent us one for trial and demonstration purposes. We should actually probably put that in one of our cars. Maybe two. I really think we should. I think we should. I know. Because then we'd look like the uh, immature endurance racing team that we are. Oh, wait, I mispronounced that, didn't I? Sorry. My bad. <laughs> We could so what have, does the Sentinel system do? We could have three cameras with picture in picture. We could have, if we ever get the AIM system to work, open invitation to anybody from AIM to come on and give us a little bit of love. We need some help. Um, and then we could have all our telemetry on there. And then we can have it streamed live into the paddock or around the world to our millions of fans. We're apparently very popular in Kenya right now. Don't know why, but that's fine. <laughs> And it can integrate all the uh, available race statistics from like race here and everything. So we could actually see how we're doing on video. We wouldn't even have to carry around our phone anymore. Live. I, I love it. Dominator Dawson again tonight. Guess what? We've got more questions. Ben, we've got a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Uh, I, I think I'm going to form this uh, a little different than it was written in. Ben okay. Dawson, what are the best gauges to have on your car? And then as a bonus we're going to say how do we think the best way to use them is um so we just mean we're not talking about by these auto meter gauges you're saying what things do we need to measure and visualize in the car what, 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 what gauge measurements right. in priority would you want in your car and, and i'm um, talking you've got a steering wheel and blank right. you got nothing okay so the first time I drove race bar, I had a steering wheel and blank. They're like, hey, I was like, well, there's no gauges in here. Do you like, see the yeah, surprise the look on my face? Uh, yeah. So the one gauge was they had a puke tube for over coolant overflow that was just routed right to the center of the windshield. Like, if you see water coming up out of here, pull it in because you're overheating. That mm -hmm. was the only way to tell how the car was doing, which is one way to do it. Those they, guys still also have, they still have the tube. Dude, they, those guys also blew up a shocking amount of motors during that era. I don't know how they're doing with motors these days, uh, but back then they blew a lot of them up and we're like retorquing. <laughs> like, just, I'm just going to torque this this head down super tight so we can have enough compression to finish it'll, the weekend. Not great. It'll flatten. So, it'll flatten. It'll be fine. Yeah, we'll just we'll just we'll just pull this head flat. Anyhow, that's one way to do it. I don't recommend it. I, I think it's smart to look after your mechanical components. As, as well as you can, and with as much bandwidth as you're going to have in the car. Like, you know, you don't need to be met watching the air fuel ratio per cylinder in the car. You know what I mean? Like, there's, there's some things that it's good to know, and I've seen people measure that in the car, but I don't necessarily need to be personally involved with that while I'm driving. What am I going to do? Yes, Bill. Ben Dawson, Ben Dawson, I, I hate to interrupt your answer, but we've been interrupted <laughs> by Let's Play the Gauge Game with Miss Vicky. Miss Vicky. Oh, yeah? Yes. What is the first gauge that you would put into a car? Ben and I will be the judges. I will end okay. up in the bathtub this way, but that's fine. I've got pillows. Uh, yeah. No. R you have RPMs. Nothing, you have nothing there. So you want a tachometer first? Yes. All right. Is that your final answer? Uh, 
Yeah, I would start with the tech. Okay. Mr. Dawson, what do you think of that? I would have a tech second. Second. Probably. Hmm. I I want a water temperature gauge. If my vehicle is water cooled, I want a water temperature gauge first and foremost. Okay. Okay. So you're worried about. I mean, te- you're Vicky builds all the engines, engines, but I want. I, Vicky builds all the engines, but I want her to have a water gauge first in the car because I don't want her to have to build a bunch of engines. So you want a water temperature gauge, or do you want a water pressure gauge? Uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess a water pressure gauge is going to tell you immediately if you have a problem, but a water temperature gauge is going to tell you if your water is getting too hot for another reason, if it's present but too hot. So I don't know. I mean, I haven't thought about this, but I, I would like to have both. You'd like to have, a, you know, a, if I had a choice between an oil pressure or an oil temp gauge, I would probably choose a pressure gauge first just to make sure I have some or at least, <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to at least see that it's there um, and then worry about the temperature second. But I think with water, I would rather have a, a overall system temperature gauge first and then a pressure gauge, I guess. I don't know. What do you think? Is that bad? Um, no. I mean, I, I like, you know me, Ben. If, if one is good, two would be better. So I'll take them all. Well, right. You want, to, you want to measure everything. But but the key things, I think, is you need to be kind of monitoring every straightaway or like your water you, you, temperature. You, 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 you're going to ruin the game. You're going to ruin the game. Oh, Miss Vicky, you, okay, right. yeah. you got a 50% on that first one. What's your second? Well, you know what your second gauge is now. We're thinking water yeah. and tack. What's the next gauge you want? Anybody got the Jeopardy theme? Do, do, do. No, well, it's a tie between the gas and the oil for me. A gas gauge and an oil pressure or temperature? Uh, oil pressure. Okay. All right. Mr. Dawson, what are you, what's your thoughts? What did you say? Gas gauge and oil pressure? Yes. Those, those two aren't bad. Um, I mean, I can't think of any, many other things I want to be trying to check up on. Like, oh, we've got a tack, we've got a water temp, right? Was the mm-hmm. first two we threw out there, mm-hmm. and then we're talking. I mean, I mean, you need a gas indicator in the car, right? Like, I mean, you're always kind of uh, watching how much fuel you have in, in the car, and like, hey, we're reporting back to the team. I got five eighths of a tank or whatever. I mean, that's something that I'm always mm-hmm. trying to pay attention to in the car. So that's definitely what you got to have. I'm not sure what order it would come in, but you got mm-hmm. to have that. And you got. I, I mean, uh, to me, that's equal with the, with the oil pressure because you know you just need to be keeping an eye on that oil pressure and making sure you're. Know, well, you know, I more, think more, the more, thing with the oil pressure is is it's used for diagnosing more so than the oil temperature is you know right like you, you got it or you don't right so that's a problem you know if you're driving along like, oh there's no oil pressure i better shut this down um, well but, yeah, yeah. If you notice the temp is getting hot like i don't know that i've ever sat there and watched oil temp in a race car but I definitely yeah. watched oil pressure and another thing to make sure just a side note about oil pressure gauges is that you're likely to see kind of one pressure range idling around the pits and then mm-hmm. under load of track RPM, you're likely to see a different oil pressure reading. So just make sure you understand from the person whose car you might be driving, if it's not your own, you're not already kind of used to seeing that. Like, hey, what kind of oil pressure am I going to see sitting on the grid or, or right under the pits versus what, what do you expect to see with this, this engine when it's healthy, when I'm out on track, you know, doing 6,000 RPMs all over the place. Mm-hmm. Just a side note, something to be cognizant of. Don't freak out if you're riding around the pits and your oil pressure looks super low. Say, hey, is this normal? You know, something else. I mean, hmm. we, we use the oil temperature to know when the car is capable of going on track in the beginning of the day. That's about it. Oh, okay. So you're using it just to make sure it's worked up enough. Yeah. We don't want to be hitting it too hard before it's up to temp. Yeah, if, you're, if I'm driving a car that's fancy enough to have a diff cooler, I'm going to want to mm-hmm. have that temperature somewhere I can see it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to check it as often as uh, the, the, the kind of the big four. But, you know, if you're, if you're doing some fancy enough crap where you got a diff cooler, you might as well know how, you might as well gauge it and know how it's doing, right? Mm-hmm, for sure. Okay, so I've got two more gauges before we get to how to use Sorry, them. that was a side note. That was a side note, too. Okay, so I've got two more gauges, and one's technically not a gauge. Where would you rank a shift light? Cake. <laughs> That's in the cake ranking of like things that were nice to have. Okay. Um, what about you, Miss Vicky? You, not... fight for, you fight for shift lights. I I do... I would like to have shift lights. They uh having a hard time with, you know, sometimes you just get so busy that you overshift. I mean, you just kind of run the revs. Okay. I think yeah. I think we should have a shift light. Okay. Or an, or sure. an AC, ECU lockout or something. Yeah, something because I mean, I've been guilty of that of over revving. And okay. and not intentionally. It's just I've not 
exactly sure where I am when. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Well, here's the other thing that I've that I've noticed, especially happened in my last ride, mostly is because my headset now is noise canceling, so I can't hear the car as well. Mm, yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Definitely, that's definitely a good scenario where you're like, oh, I have this this situation in the car or this situation yeah. with my safety gear makes it where I do need this extra thing. So yeah, and if that's the case where you're not hearing yeah. the car well enough, you definitely want to shift light. You yeah. Because I mean, that, the other side of that is if you're driving a car that's not super fragile with the engine or, you know, it doesn't have a crazy high rev limiter, you know, mm -hmm. you're driving to Miata, and, you know, whoops, I have to shift at 6,700 and I accidentally hit the 7,000 RPM red line. The car just was like, bum, 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 bum. The biggest mm -hmm. thing you did is you just drove right past the car's best power band and you kind of slowed yourself down a little bit by being yeah. out of the peak power range. You kind of slapped the limiter. So ho hopefully you're driving a car that's not too crazy. And if you hit the hit the chip for a second, that's a second kind of firewall to remind you like, well, time to shift. But, you know, that's the, right. biggest thing you probably, the biggest thing you probably did was you just weren't optimizing your acceleration for a minute while you're way up there th thinking about passing that car or whatever else you were doing on track. And that's pretty much what it is. Shifting. Yeah. So yeah, right. that's, I mean, it's not the, it's not the end of the world, but I think it's just like a good idea, especially if you're having trouble hearing the phone. Yes. All right. All right. So now where on the list would you rank a broken gauge? Right, check, engine, check engine light. In, no, what you mean? Just, like? just no, the gauge does not function. I don't understand. What, what gauge would you? Gauge oh no function oh. We were last. Got... <laughs> last yeah. one. You can't have one. Don't do it because then you don't know which one. Okay, let's stop. I'm trying to figure out what the question is. Is that the one that you would say of all the gauges, which one would you rather not have working is what you're asking? No. What I'm doing is How I'm trying valuable. To make, make a point that your gauges, if they're there, have to work or the driver yeah. won't right. trust any of them. Right. Your gauge has, your gauge has no value if it's broken. Not yeah, helping you at all. Actually, it, it makes you question all the gauges so then you don't really know we any of them so if you have a gauge that's yeah. not working cover it with black tape do something make it go away yeah it turns your whole car into fake news you know what i'm saying oh, <laughs> all right moving on from fake news um, okay i've got gauges they're fantastic what if uh none of my drivers are using them though or what if they can't see them mm, well you know you can get something called idiot lights so, I'll tell you, if, you can't, if they can't see them, they might blow your engine up. That's what's happened to us before. Right. Yes. So a, a gauge that's not seeable is is useless. But mm -hmm. how do how do you think the best way to use the gauges is? How do how should how should you view the gauges? Oh. Like when you get in the car at a pit stop, or you know, end of the day, or somewhere in between. I'll tell you what I do, Bill. Oh, I like go. to I like to watch the uh, I like to watch the tachometer. Mm -hmm. uh, out, of, out of the corner of my eye, sort of like you mentioned in a previous episode, most of the time you, you're you're kind of here in the car and you're not my superpower to for anything. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, you build superpower, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I think my eye lands on the tack every once in a while, but probably not every shift. I think ideally you want to try to train yourself to be looking at your key gauges like water temperature. Uh, mm -hmm. like I, I hope if somebody's driving a car with an engine that I personally maintain out of my wallet, I hope that driver is looking at the water gauge every straightaway. Like every time you get a check chance on sort of unwind on track, if you're not in the middle of traffic, check your water temp, um, just to make sure everything's still working in there and you're not overheating the car. What do you think about that, Bill? I try to, and, and, you know, there's going to be straightaways where there's a lot of stuff going on and it's probably a better yeah. use of my time. But you know, it's, it's if, totally yes. If you try, that's what I, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yes, you're saying you're saying the same thing. I, I think I'm saying you know, like at least idealize the notion of looking yes. every chance you get. You know, every every idle moment to kind of train yourself to be trying to check your water temp gauge. And you know, sometimes you got to say, "Sorry, water temp gauge, I got to pass these three cars out of this corner, and I'm gonna check you on the next straightaway." But mm -hmm. if you and that water temp gauge have a relationship of checking in with each other and being cool with each other all the time, very good idea. What about you, Miss Vicky? Well, how do you use the gauges? I use them on the straightaway. Every straightaway or every well, red lap or well, you know, anytime I get a break, I usually kind of do it once over, just real fast. Um, yeah. go go through everything. Usually if if I'm not 
actively engage with a component mm -hmm. um, or a competitor, um, then is is when I check. I just you know yeah. kind of do the loop. Right. Um, Makes sense. Get that little bit of a breather because um, most of the time you're you're just you're mentally engaged on racing the line, and those are the areas where you know the lines are muscle memory. So you don't really have you to think about. Tag. I watch my tack a lot. I, I actually in 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 my whole circle, the tack is usually where I end up looking at the most because it, because I can't hear right now is is I usually determine um, where my where my revs are at for shifting. Yeah. So instead, <laughs> I, of, you know, is, instead of hearing it, it became a visual thing for me. So it's part of the loop. I, I totally I totally get that. I. I realized mm -hmm. that I completely lied or obfuscated the way I used the tack the most. And I don't know whether it was me being competitive and not want to admit this, but, you know, even since my days of karting on an oval track, you know, I had like a micron tack that was telling me everything my brakes and strat and flathead engine was doing. You know, it was pretty high tech even back in like 2002, 2003, but, you know, I had temperature and RPM and all that stuff. And, you know, if I had happened to notice, you know, maybe I was pulling – 6700 rpm coming out of you know turn three or you know coming out of turn two or coming out of turn four whatever like yeah my exit turns um you know i had a good lap time and i happened to notice my rpm was about this so suddenly right. ben's got a bench ben's got a benchmark for what makes a good lap bam i need to be all i need to be on this much rpm coming out of a corner to be using the best you know using the best part of my power band with this little engine um, and, you know, maximizing my, my speed down the straightaway. You know, if I can ever get better than this coming out of the corner, great, but this is at least a good tack reading baseline for exiting a corner. And that's the way I use the tack the most obsessively in road course racing too, is coming out of the corner, like in the Miata, coming out of Oak Tree. I knew I should be sitting on 4,400 RPM, whatever it was. You know, if I'm, if I'm, you know, if I'm in third gear coming out, I need to be running at enough speed to justify being in third gear. So I'm pretty obsessive about like making sure I come out of the corner with the kind of RPM I'm hoping for to get down the straightaway well. So that is my secret way I'm using the tech. Sure, I probably am watching this jump. I'm making sure I'm timing my upships the right way, but not anywhere near as obsessively as I watch the tack on corner exit. If I come off missing a few hundred RPM, I'm like, what did I just do? I am hosed for this whole lap. You know what I mean? That's, mm -hmm. that's where I'm really obsessing over my tack the most. Right. So so I kind of do that, but I don't do it at corner exit. I do it at a, at a landmark. Like... Um, the next flag station after uh, a turn, I will at this one, I was at 5,400 and, you know, sure. it's it because at least with the, with the endurance racing that we do with the number of car counts we have turn exit is usually busy. You know, yeah, you're, you're right. If you're, if you're working traffic the right way, you should be pretty busy all the time around the turns. That's, that's right. And, and you're right. Like I use a, my backup obsessive reference is like, I pulled a three, four shift here. Like I use my landmark yeah. like that. Like shift. I'm, I'm yep. watching for my, sh I, I do, mm -hmm. I do my shifts. I do my shifts, my visual landmark. And I check my tack on the way out, kind of having an idea of what I'm hoping for as far as uh, RPM on the exit. You know what we used at road? Well, I know I used it at road Atlanta and, and I think Alan was competing against me for it. I think Vicky may have it too. We, uh, we were at the, we were using El Jefe, the trophy truck and yeah. mm -hmm. there is no fifth gear. Repeat after right. no, no fifth gear. There is no fifth Never. gear. So you can't use fifth gear or else you trash the transmission. But so on the on the back straight of Road Atlanta, it was where could you get tapped out at fourth? Right, right. Where am I? Who are you hitting the chip? Like, who's hitting the chip the quickest, right? That's right. And and it was always like one board before the wall on the right runs out. Yeah. And <laughs> if you think about it, from that point on, we're just sitting there, you know driving yeah yeah and our, we, we first put that m50 engine into our e30 it had a chip and like we were trying to figure out how to, to defeat it but like yeah we, when we did our we tested our wing we got the nine lives wing and mm -hmm. we built a little splitter little splitter for our car we were testing the wing angle interestingly enough and when we had too much wing let's see yeah when we had too much wing we were we weren't hitting the chip but we were fast mm -hmm. as shit through the corners when we when we uh flattened the wing out we're hitting the chip way early. So you're, you know, going down the front of the back stretch of VR and, and 
like you know, right before you want to hit the right. brakes, all of a sudden it is like, puh, puh, like ah, uh... so that was really telling for us as far as how much the arrow was affecting us. It's like, oh, I can't even hit the chip with the wing standing up. But you flatten the wing back out, and you're like, bump, 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 all over the chip before you even need the brake. So yeah, it's weird. wow. So which one ended up with a faster lap time? Uh, no, <laughs> no, the wing flattened out. We could BIR it, but it helped us helped us to have the, the wing flattened out more yeah. than having. We had, we had too much downforce on the on where we had it standing up too much, but we couldn't mm-hmm. couldn't get to, get to enough top speed. Hmm. Awesome. Sorry, sorry to sorry to derail, but that that's that's oh. an interesting experience we had. It's going to vary from track to track, though, right? Sure, absolutely. Might not have been the same. Might not have been the same equation at CMP, for example. Exactly. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm. Hey, thank you. <laughs>